is my pleasure to introduce uh, Professor Wilfried Schmidt from Harvard, who will tell us about Hodge theory and uh, unitary representations of reductive Lie groups. All right. So uh, let me start out with uh, some motivation. Uh, suppose M is a compact complex manifold with a uh, Romanian metric BS uh, squared. Then I can use the metric to put an inner product on the, the round homology, which, however, is far from canonical. It depends very much on the choice of metric. Well, now suppose M is a compact Taylor manifold. Uh, then the so called Taylor package uh, puts an indefinite Hermitian form on the Ram cohomology, and that is alternatingly. Uh, positive and negative definite on the hard sum ends. So by flipping signs, one obtains a positive definite inner product on the Durham homology, which depends only on a topological datum. That is the cohomology class of the Keller metric and the Hodge decomposition, that is the complex structure. Uh, so now let me describe the problem that I'm concerned with. Uh, suppose G sub R is a reductive linear Lie group, K sub R a maximal compact subgroup, and then G, K without the subscript R, the complexifications of those two groups. Uh, then one can choose a compact real form uh, of the complex group, which intersects uh, the uh, real group in the maximal compact subgroup. And that choice is unique. Uh, then I uh, let um, the corresponding lowercase German letters with sub subscript, uh, the lowercase German letters denote the Lie algebras of these groups. Uh, and I want to recall the notion of a Harris Chandra model. So that's a finitely generated, uh, uh, a finitely generated U of uh, G module, that is a module over the universal enveloping algebra of the Lie algebra, uh, such that the actions of uh, uh, the Lie algebra and K are compatible. And when V is decomposed into a direct sum of irreducible K modules, each irreducible occurs finitely often. One calls an irreducible Harris Chandra module unitarizable if it carries a positive definite invariant in a product. When that exists, it is unique up to scaling. And now it's an early result of Harris Chandra that the irreducible unitary representations of GR correspond bijectively to irreducible, unitarizable Harris Chandra modules. So, to understand the irreducible uh, unitary representations of the group GR is transformed into a seemingly algebraic problem, but a very difficult. Now, the irreducible Harris Chandra modules, whether or not they are unitarizable, they have been classified. And there are three classification schemes due to um, Langlands, Knapp, Zuckerman, Wolgen, Zuckerman, Burns, and Bernstein. They are on the surface different, but of course, they classify the same objects. So they are irreducible, they are equivalent, but not obviously so. So whether an irreducible Harris Chandra module carries a non-zero but conceivably indefinite GR invariant emission form, uh, which still is, un is unique up to uh, scaling, that can be determined easily. It's a simple algebraic problem. But it is difficult, very difficult problem to determine a priori, whether a non-zero GR invariant emission form is positive or negative. That, in effect, is the problem of classifying 
irreducible unitary representations of PR. I should mention that Vogan and his co-workers uh, have developed an algorithm which allows you determine, to determine, well, by, by computer calculation, whether uh, any particular um, Harry Chandra module is unitarizable. But it's an algorithm. It does not amount to a description of what the irreducible uh, unitary representations are. So back to the problem of describing irreducible unitary representations, one can assume without loss of generality that the irreducible Harishchandra module that we are considering has a real infinitesimal character, an observation of Wolven. And that means that the center of the universal enveloping algebra acts via a character Kaisa Blanda, this is somewhat technical in Harish Chandra's notation, uh, which lies in the uh, real linear span of the wave ladder. So there are other uh, unitarizable Harish Chandra modules, but those are easily described. So the problem really comes down to those which have, in this sense, a real infinitesimal character. So an uh, important observation, suppose V is an irreducible Harish Chandra module with real infinitesimal character, then there exists a non-zero UR invariant ambition form of the Harish Chandra module. Remember U sub R is the V algebra of a compact real form. So this is not the invariant emission form that we're interested in, but it exists. And it is unique up to scaling. So if V also admits a non-zero GR invariant emission form, that's the one we're interested in, then the two are very directly related. So, and I'll come back to that in just a moment. So as a matter of terminology, a non-zero UR invariant emission form on an irreducible Harish Chandra module with real infinitesimal character, I call that a polarization. So suppose V is an irreducible Harish Chandra module polarized uh, by a particular UR invariant emission form then a non-zero GR invariant emission form, the one that we are interested in, exists if and only if the Cartan involution can be made, act, made to act on the harish chandra module, of course, compatibly with the action of the complexified V algebra. And in this situation, the eigenspace decomposition for theta, it's an involution, so it has eigenvalues plus minus one, this eigenspace decomposition is invariant and orthogonal with respect to both emission forms. So if uh, V, the harish chandra module uh, we are interested in, uh, is decomposed in this way, and if uh, one of the emission forms is rescaled, then uh, if V lies in V plus or V minus, if and only if the GR invariant inner product is plus or minus the UR invariant uh, inner product. So the two are very directly related. Uh, and if one understands the GR invariant Hermitian uh, form uh, well enough, then one can determine whether V is unitarizable. So now let me describe the uh, polarization geometrically. Suppose X is the flag variety of G. So that is the complex projective variety with transitive algebraic uh, G action, which as a set is the collection of all the world subalgebras. And therefore, it can be identified with 
uh, gene or B, the homogeneous space where B is any particular well subgroup. Uh, the weight lattice of G, uh, so uh, these, this is the lattice of characters of B, can be naturally identified with what I'll call capital lambda, namely the group of G equivariant algebraic line bundles on the flag variety. And I denote that by letting lambda, little lambda correspond to L sub lambda, the line bundle determined by the lambda. Now let P sub X be the sheaf of algebraic differential operators on X. One can uh, twist it by sections of uh, uh, the line bundle, the sheaf of sections of a line bundle, uh, L sub lambda minus rho. And that now is the sheaf of algebraic differential operators acting on sections of uh, the line bundle L lambda minus rho. You may wonder what rho is. Well, rho, two rho corresponds to the inverse canonical line bundle. So this is, um, how shall I say, this is sort of the minor annoyances in the subject that very often there is this shift by rho. Now, uh, as a general observation, E sub lambda, as I defined it, is a G equivariant sheaf of OX algebras for any lambda in the uh, complexification of the lattice, even though the sheaf of holomorphic sections uh, has no uh, has no meaning unless uh, lambda minus rho lies in the weight lattice. So uh, again, let me make clear what I'm talking about. So D lambda, the sheaf of differential operators, that makes sense for any uh, lambda in the complexification of the lattice, the complex linear span of the lattice, even though what it acts naturally on, as I defined it, is the sheaf of sections of lambda minus rho, and that exists only when lambda minus rho lies in capital lambda. But whether or not that is the case, E sub lambda makes uh, sense as a sheaf of uh, OX algebras uh, for any lambda in the complex linear span of capital lambda. So now let uh, V sub lambda be a Harishandra module, a Harishandra module with real infinitesimal character chi sub lambda. And for now, I'm not assuming that it is uh, irreducible. Then the parameter lambda, which uh, describes the infinitesimal character, is determined only up to the action of the value. But uh, one can, and I shall choose a unique dominant representative lambda. So the dominant wild chamber is a particular wild chamber, and one can choose lambda to lie in that uh, wild chamber, which makes it unique. And then uh, one has the Valensen Bernstein uh, realization of the Harris Chandra module. Namely, there exists a essentially unique Harris Chandra sheaf script D sub lambda. So that is now a coherent sheaf of D lambda modules with compatible K equivariant structure such that. Um, the cohomology of uh, this sheaf uh, script V sub lambda is the Harishandra module we're interested in in degree zero and in all other degrees, uh, the cohomology is zero. So in the irreducible case, one can describe the UR invariant emission form on the Harishandra module geometrically. So this is the Hermitian form that 
we are not directly interested in, but the one that determines the other one in terms of the um, Cartan involution. So we can determine that, we can describe that geometrically uh, in terms of the polarization on the chief script B sub lambda as follows. So uh, by definition of polarization on the level of sheaves is a bilinear form, a bilinear pairing. So bilinear with respect to B lambda cross D lambda bar of the sheaf V sub lambda times its complex conjugate into the sheaf of distributions on X. And uh, polarizations uh, behave functorially. So this is uh, part of the theory of D modules. So uh, one has this, uh, um, one has this gadget when script B sub lambda is irreducible and if the infinitesimal character chi sub lambda is real as we are assuming. And then the polarization exists. So that is part of the theory of D e modules. It exists and it's unique up to scaling. Uh, but uh, more than that, there exists a preferred choice of sign. So now suppose uh, I, well, I, there exists a unique up to scaling invariant positive measure on the X. And uh, if V1, V2 correspond to section sigma one, sigma two of the chief global sections by the Reynolds and Bernstein isomorphism, then up to scaling the UR invariant in a product of the two vectors is the integral of the polarization applied to the two sections, sigma one and sigma two complex conjugate, uh, that distribution integrated over the compact manifold. And to integrate, of course, one needs this uh, measure. And so the conclusion is that to understand the irreducible unitary representations of GR, it is at least in principle uh, enough to understand the effect of the polarization on the global sections of irreducible Harish Chandra sheaves. So um, temporarily, I want X to be uh, an arbitrary, smooth, complex, quasi-projective variety, and script B, a regular polynomial sheaf of the X module. So here, there is no twisting, and X does not need to be the flag variety. Uh, so what does regular holonomic mean? Well, regular in the context of D modules means, it means the notion, the appropriate notion of regular singular points and holonomic, well, the X modules really encode differential uh, equations, linear differential equations. And then holonomic means that uh, uh, the system of differential equations is sufficiently determined. So these are technical terms in the context of D modules. And so I should say that all Harish Chandra sheaves are indeed regular holonomial. So then one has the notion of a, what's called a good filtration. Uh, and so this is now on the regular holonomic sheaf of the X modules. Uh, so it starts at some uh, um, integer A, uh, which has a geometric description, but I don't want to go into that. So it's an increasing uh, filtration by 
or x coherent subsheaves fp of screw e uh, and um, coherent of course this is the uh, chief theoretic uh, analog of finite dimensional and so that the if I take differential operators of uh, level L uh, or lower apply to uh, the peak level uh, of the sheaf, then I end up in uh, L plus B, the L plus B level of the sheaf uh, for all L and P. And equality holds when P is, great, is sufficiently large. So first order differential operator uh, raise the level at most uh, of the filtration at most by one. And beyond a certain point, they raise it exactly by one. So as I said before, uh, the subscript L refers to the uh, order of the differential operators that we're talking about. So in the regular holonomic case, and when, when we have uh, a uh, regular holonomic uh, sheaf of the X modules, good filtrations always exist. But the category of all regular holonomic filtered, filtered by good filtration, the X modules, that does not have good functorial properties. So they exist, they're far from unique, but uh, now we get to Saito's theory of mixed Hodge modules and a suitable extension of his theory of modules singles out the class of regular polynomic filtered EX modules. And filtered of course means by a good filtration which are closed under all the standard functors between the X modules. So in effect, Saito says that while uh, the filtration is far from unique, if I look at filtered modules, there is a category of filtered DX modules, which is closed under the standard, standard functors uh, of the X module theory. And this theory, of course, is uh, local in the uh, Zariski sense. Uh, and uh, therefore, uh, if X is the flag variety, then um, the theory of mixed Hodge modules uh, it, um, uh, applies to all interesting Harish-Chandra sheaves uh, script in lambda. So including the irreducible Harish-Chandra sheaves, the so-called standard and co-standard Harish-Chandra sheaves, and certain extensions of the former by the latter. So uh, the theory applies. And since uh, Saito's theory uh, is uh, uh, in some sense, uh, the, the structure is the, it's locally defined. Uh, it works even if we're dealing with uh, twisted sheaves of differential op operators. So it applies in our context. And that means that if I have a Harish Chandra sheaf uh, script E lambda, it carries two canonical functorial filtrations thanks to Saito's theory. So first of all, a K invariant good filtration by OX coherent subsheaves, that is the Hodge filtration. So there is now as part of Saito's theory, uh, a category where the good filtrations are part of the structure. And in addition, there is a finite filtration by Harish Chandra subsheaves. So these are now sheaves of the lambda modules, 
that is the weight filtration and the quotients of the weight filtration are completely reducible e lambda module. Okay, so um, in uh, our case, of course, we now can apply Saito's theory. So Harish Chandra sheaves script e lambda have uh, a Hodge filtration, which uh, then descends through the cohomology uh, groups of, uh, uh, of, of the uh, of these sheaves. And so one conjecture is that the higher cohomology of these uh, filtrons is zero for all k other than zero. Recall that uh, in Behrens and Bernstein's theory, the higher cohomology uh, of V sub lambda, script V sub lambda, is zero. So this is now um, a substantial refinement of, uh, of Behrens and Bernstein's uh, vanishing theorem. So not only do the higher cohomology groups of uh, the Harshtrander sheaf vanish, but also the higher homology groups of the filtrons. And assuming this conjecture is correct, then the filtrations, of course, descend to canonical functorial filtrations on the space of global sections, the Harishchandra model. Now, in Hodge theory, uh, I'm sorry, the, so the FP V sub lambda are finite dimensional uh, K invariant subspaces. Uh, and as I said before, the uh, quotients are completely reducible. Now, in uh, Hodge theory, uh, the uh, filtration, the Hodge filtration is preserved by morphisms. And this is the case in Cyclos theory. So morphisms of Harris-Chandra modules, when uh, the uh, Hodge theory uh, applies, so with real infinitesimal character, they preserve both filtrations. And not only do they preserve them, but they preserve them strictly. So suppose now that um, V sub lambda, the Harish Chandra module, realized as the space of sections of the corresponding Harish Chandra sheaf is irreducible. So, as I mentioned earlier, the polarization in the sense of Saito that induces a UR invariant Hermitian form uh, on V lambda by integration, as I mentioned earlier. And so now uh, come the important conjectures. So if I have a um, vector V, which lies in the peak level of the Hodge filtration of the Harris Chandra module I'm interested in. And also in the uh, annihilator of uh, FP minus one V e sub lambda. Remember that there is a, uh, this GR invariant condition form. So that I use to define the notion of the annihilator. And then if V is not zero, our conjecture is that the UR invariant emission form has alternating sign, alternating with the parity of P. So that, of course, is an analog of what happens in classical Hodge theory. So uh, the, in classical Hodge theory, of course, the the cohomology one is interested in has a by weighting 
So in this particular case, um, the vibrating is, uh, uh, I mean, there is no real structure. So there is still a vibrating that I described by this intersection, but a vibrating which does not, uh, and there's no complex conjugation involved, but nonetheless, then on the vibrate on the graded pieces, the inner product has alternating sign just as it does in classical Hodge theory. So that is our conjecture. So suppose that uh, E sub lambda is irreducible. So the uh, decomposition, which relates the uh, two uh, G, GR and the UR invariant transition form. Uh, and then assuming our conjecture, uh, the uh, D lambda, I mean, assuming the conjecture, of course, uh, if I take the uh, direct sum of the um, Hodge pieces corresponding to even P's, uh, to even uh, integers P, and those corresponding to odd integers P, those are P plus and D minus respectively, or of course, vice versa. So now I call a Harish-Chandra module simple if Remember, A is the lowest level of the Hodge filtration that has uh, geometric meaning, uh, but I will not go into that. So uh, the lowest beach piece of the Hodge filtration is, so, so I mean, again, by definition, uh, the lambda is simple. If first of all, the lowest level of the Hodge filtration corresponds to the direct sum of lowest k types. So that has representation theoretic meaning. And then uh, as we go on, the peak level is uh, uh, gotten by applying differential operators of order up to p minus a to the lowest level. So I call a high general module simple if that is the case. So assuming our conjecture, when V lambda also carries a Hermitian form, in the case of a simple uh, Hodge module, then uh, it is unitarizable if and only if uh, the GR invariant Hermitian form is uh, positive or negative. Uh, definite on the lowest k type. So in the uh, so if I have a Hodge mod module that is simple, then the conjecture would say we can tell whether or not it is, it is unitarizable just by looking at the lowest k types, and that is a very easy condition to check. Now, of course, not all Hodge general modules are simple. I mean, not all unitized by hash channel modules are possible. And so one theorem, and uh, that is actually uh, part of uh, uh, well, our work on this, uh, on this conjecture, the Hodge filtration of tempered irreducible hash channel modules with real infinitesimal character those Hodge filtrations are simple. So what, what does tempered mean? Uh, in Harichandra's uh, theory of uh, uh, irreducible Harichandra modules, the tempered Harichandra modules pay, play a special role. I mean, those correspond to unitary representations that uh, enter the Plancherel decomposition or what might be called the Fourier decomposition of L2 of G. Of course, in the, in the case of compact groups, all irreducible representations show up in L2 of K. 
in the case of uh, semi-simple groups GR, only the tempered irreducible uh, representations show up, and those are obviously unitarizable. So in Harishandra's theorem, those are obviously unitarizable. And uh, from our point of view, they are also obviously unitarizable uh, if our uh, conjecture is correct. So these Harishandra modules, in terms of our conjecture, should be considered obviously unitarizable. So we suspect that uh, there are some other Harishandra modules that should be obviously unitarizable in the same sense, namely the uh, Harishandra modules covered by Arthur's conjecture. Uh, so we strongly suspect that they also have simple Hodge filtration. So those are um, Harishandra modules that have arithmetic significance. Now, uh, the main remaining difficulties in proving the conjecture <coughs> are, first of all, establishing the vanishing theorem. And <coughs> that you know, is a difficult problem, but conceivably within reach. But then showing that the uh, polarization forms restrict non-degeneratively to all Hodge flags. That at the moment seems to be uh, a deeper fact. And I have to confess, uh, at the moment, we have no idea how to approach that. So assuming the conjecture, one then has uh, a notion of complexity on irreducible uh, unitary representation. Uh, so. I guess, as I hinted before, in general, the Hodge filtration is complicated. And again, as I mentioned before, uh, the arithmetically interesting unitary representations, uh, those we think have the simplest possible Hodge filtration. So um, the conjecture, uh, would provide a strong functorial framework for the study of unitary representation. And the, from, uh, um, let's say, before we uh, started our work, somehow uh, the, uh, whether or not the Harris-Chandra module, the reducible Harris-Chandra module is unitarizable or not, this seems to be uh, a, a problem where that one has no handle on. But at least, at least this conjecture, if it's proved, would give us such a handle. Okay, thank you. Okay. Are there any questions? Yeah, Wilfred? Yes. Hi, this is Philip. And, you know, obviously you've tried all the standard analytic tricks for proving vanishing. Uh, is, can it, is it possible to say why they don't work? Uh, so this is for the vanishing theorem? Excuse me? Uh, so you're asking this about the vanishing theorem or more generally? Yeah, why the sort of all the standard analytic methods that involve uh, some form of curvature or plurisome harmonicity or whatever, uh, obviously you've tried those and I just wondered why they don't work. Yeah, so first of all, if uh, lambda is uh, sufficiently regular, uh, then, in fact, there is a vanishing theorem. But uh, the point is that, I mean, the, the flag variety, of course, has, uh, I mean, the inverse canonical bundle is ample. And uh, 
the vanishing theorem that one needs in this context uh, does not, <coughs> excuse me, does not go down just to O. It goes down to uh, the uh, the square root of the canonical bundle. So one has to prove a vanishing theorem for line bundles that are e e even uh, somewhat negative. And so that, of course, um, is tricky. Uh, one can try to play uh, a sort of uh, standard games using tensoring, et cetera, but that does not seem to work. I should mention though that um, I have not completely given up uh, on the vanishing theorem. I mean, that uh, conceivably there are some tricks that one can play, but they will be technically very, very hard. I mean, the standard vanishing theorems just do not apply. Now, when it comes to uh, uh, somehow proving uh, what is, uh, uh, I mean, to proving the, the non degeneracy of these intersections, et cetera, that is even deeper. Okay. Other questions? Yeah. Hi, Wilfred. This is Carlos. Um, the, you, you, you said that Vogan has an algorithm to decide whether something is unitarizable or something like that. Um, can you can you put that together with the calculations and check check some cases of the conjecture somehow? Well, I mean the uh, so from let's say from our point of view, uh, the I mean the conjecture if one proves it up to a certain point, namely up to the uh, co-dimension of the orbit, K orbit to which the representation is attached. From that point on, uh, the filtration is what I call simple. And in Vogan's context, there is something analogous. I mean, of course, he thinks about this completely differently. So in his case too, he only has to do a finite calculation for any particular irreducible uh, representation to check whether or not the uh, invariant permission form is positive definite or not. So, uh, I mean, even though the points of view are very, very different, but uh, uh, the problem in some sense is similar. So one has to go up to not very far up in the KD composition to tell whether or not something is, uh, is unitary. And I, you know, it might be conceivable that his uh, algorithm becomes slightly simpler or slightly more efficient if he uses our information, but uh, his uh, algorithm, algorithm is computerized. So to make it any simpler doesn't matter to him. Are there any other questions? Uh, yeah. Yes. Hi. So yeah, this is Wushi. I have a question. Um, so I was wondering um, if you also conjecture something regarding the, the vanishing conjecture, if you conjecture something about the restrictions of the sheaves to Schubert varieties, um, like is the cohomology there supposed to vanish or do you conjecture something about it? Well, the Sch Schubert varieties are affine, so yes. I mean, then we have- No, no, I mean, I mean the, clo I mean, clo uh, sorry, I, I mean not, the sh I mean the, the closures of the Schubert cells. Well, I mean, in some sense, I think uh, if you're talking about the closure of the orbit of the <clears throat> on which our, excuse me, on which our sheaf lives, then it's equivalent to vanishing on X. So uh, okay. I think it's, um, it's more or less the same problem. 
Okay, I, I was wondering if one could like imagine playing games where you like risk closures and study the long exact sequence in cohomology corresponding to such and sort of reduce induct to, to proving vanishing on smaller dimensional things. Well, uh, no, I, so I mean, of course, I, I, I cannot say that uh, uh, any particular suggestion does not work, but uh, we've certainly tried, uh, how shall I put it? We've tried sort of all the obvious things. Okay, thanks. Also, you, you had this integral earlier in your talk. Yeah. Um, is it is it possible to understand that as um, in some intersection theory of cycles, like purely in algebraic geometry? Well, I mean, we are integrating a distribution. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, I mean, I don't know exactly what you mean. Okay. Other questions? Can I ask another question? Um, this is Carl again. Um, uh, would, do you think it, would there be a, a vanishing kind of conjecture for more general mixed Hodge modules on other kinds of varieties which aren't aren't the ones that come from? I'm sorry, I didn't hear what you said. Uh, would there be a vanishing conjecture for other mixed Hodge modules, more general mixed Hodge modules? Uh, well, I mean, I think the vanishing theorem, of course, should hold for uh, for all Hodge modules. But I mean, the issue, of course, is that we're twisting them. So it's it's really Hodge modules twisted by a somewhat negative line bundle, and uh, that's rather subtle, I would say. Okay. More questions, please. So you 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 mentioned the the regularity in in answering one of the first questions. So I mean, if you have if you have lambda assumed dominant with lambda minus rho regular, is that enough to to make everything or trivial, or is it more than that that you need? Well, I think if you do that, then problems become much much simpler. But from a representation theoretic point of view, it's not interesting. I mean, right. The, the, the modules that we're interested in do not fall into that uh, into that category. Right. Okay. Thanks. More questions? Okay. If not, let's thank Gertrude again for a very nice talk. Thank you. <laughs>